Hi, everyone. Um, you all made it to the end of PyDX, so that is pretty amazing. I am a person who does not make it to the end of conferences usually, so I'm especially thankful that you people are all here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what I have learned by teaching or facilitating the teaching of approximately 100 women who have been learning how to program. That number comes from uh, Django Girls, where I am a co-organizer of the Portland chapter. Um, and we just finished up our fourth workshop this past weekend, and every workshop is about 30 people. So if you multiply 30 by four, you don't really know math very well, you end up at 100. Um, and I'm on Twitter, I have uh, a spine cone, you can see that on various slides. Um, and really quick, I would just want to thank PyDX and uh, the various people involved in it. It's such a supportive place to be a new speaker, and this is my, this is my first ever conference talk. They, I brought um, my first conference workshop here last year, um, and it was sufficiently supportive that I went on to do about four more this year. So if you are interested in getting started speaking, this is a good place to do it. Um, and then also I want to thank the other people who helped me make Django Girls PDX a thing, which who are Haley and Nate currently. Nate is here. Um, and then also Lacey and Kenneth, who were our organizers until recently. And if you know either Lacey or Kenneth, you know how hard they work and how much they need a break. Um, and then I have some pictures in here that are from Lacey and uh, Summit at Doug, who is a Django Girls volunteer. So this is me, Tarion. Um, as I mentioned, I am a Django Girls PDX co-organizer. Um, I am a Ruby on, Ruby on Rails developer, actually, but I have felt very welcomed by this snake pit. Um, I can be seen ruining other people's wedding cakes sometimes in pictures like this one. And although I am not an expert in computer science or in teaching, um, I have done a lot of teaching. And I think if you are also not an expert either of those things, you can be a great teacher, too. Um, so Django Girls is an example of informal education. Um, it's kind of a nebulous topic. It includes things like I, I recently uh, was talking to a friend who is involved in um, rock climbing informal teaching. And basically, it's just anything that is generally taught by teachers who know a lot about the subject matter, like programming or rock climbing, but they don't necessarily have training in teaching people that subject, like currently you can't go to very many schools and get training in computer science education. It's just not a thing that academia has caught on to yet. Um, and similarly, there's not really certification for rock climbing teaching. Um, there's not really like specific kinds of informal education, but for me it means that students aren't being graded. They don't have to pay the thousands of dollars that formal education usually involves. Um, and what they're getting out of it is more about what they, they want to get out of their education rather than like, this. you have this Bachelor of Arts degree and it means these things. Um, and I think that we really need informal teachers in programming especially because uh, formal education is really not accessible to most people. There's financial barriers, there's, um, you really have to devote all of your time to it and so if you have caregiving responsibilities, just general responsibilities at all, you can't participate in formal education. Um, and something that I think would be really cool to imagine is if every programmer just devoted some of their time to helping a person in their community learn to program, we could really mess with the current demographics of the tech industry, um, which as we all probably know are not great as far as how diverse they are. Um, and if none of that matters to you, um, and you just care about yourself, that's fine, because teaching also helps you become a better programmer. Um, you might be familiar with the way that if you explain a problem you're having with software to someone, it sort of solidifies the idea better in your own mind, and teaching is the same way. So why is this stuff important to me? Um, this is a picture of my first teaching experience, which was um, as a tutor in college. And that was um, very illuminating for me because a lot of the people that came in to tutoring, um, they were having a hard time in their classes and it wasn't usually because they just weren't trying. It was often because they were expected to know something like um, you know, two or three years of high school math and they didn't know it and 
their classmates who had a lot more privilege, as if you were in Kojo's talk, you would know about privilege, like the kind of school you went to in high school um, that their classmates had. And um, well, further back in history, if you go back to the year 1998, um, is when I first got involved with programming, um, my family got our first computer. And for some reason, they let me, I was eight years old, just do whatever I wanted with it. And I chose to um, make my own websites where uh, the only thing I cared about was Sailor Moon. And so I would just go to, um, I think it was Yahoo at the time, was what you could Google with. Um, I don't even know the verb anymore. It's like, oh, I'm going to go Google that um, on Yahoo. Um, but it was really cool as an eight-year-old because you could type Sailor Moon and you come up with these websites. Like, this is not mine, unfortunately. I don't, I don't remember the URLs in many of mine. Um, but you come up with these websites, and as an eight-year-old, you could say, like, oh, I could totally do that. Um, and you could, like, there are a couple of really cool guides out there. Um, in particular, the, the Neopets HTML guide is one that I relied on a lot to learn HTML. Um, and then you, you wind up with this beautiful thing here with uh, no JavaScript, surely, or anything particularly confusing for a newcomer. And having this background of learning a program where I, I wasn't sitting down like, okay, today I'm gonna learn you know, HTTP requests and tomorrow I'm going to learn about uh, CSS. It was more like, I want to make this beautiful thing and here are the, the tools that I can use to do that. Uh, that's something that I really wanted beginners to have access to. And in 1998, most people did not have access to computers, and so that's a pretty atypical uh, journey that people have. Um, so I got out of college. Um, I really wanted to you know, make this philosophy a thing where people uh, learn by doing fun things as opposed to like coming to tutoring ashamed that they haven't taken enough algebra classes. Uh, so I did some volunteering at various groups. Um, Mostly teaching uh, young girls because I, I was thinking a lot about how hard it was to be um, a young girl and most of my peers who were also doing computery stuff were nerdy white boys and that's very isolating. Um, but after a while I, I realized that um, these are all really great things to, to do as a volunteer but sometimes you wind up in situations where you're telling the same girl like please don't throw scissors like three times in one class. Um, and so I have so much respect for people that can teach young children. Um, <clears throat> and if you're looking for um, the opportunity to teach, I really encourage you to like have some insights into what you do or don't like about it. Um, it's okay if you, you like you try one teaching experience. Like this is not for me. Maybe I like the front end a lot, and I want to teach people front end, and this was too much back end. You can you can look for another opportunity. Um, and one opportunity that I found out about was Django Girls. Um, and the reason I have chosen this picture, uh, not just because of my own uh, preferences, is that it really struck me as the kind of group that, that is about having fun and being supportive and less about like we're going to teach you this specific material and we're going to turn you into like a 10x programmer. Um, and if you're not familiar with Django Girls, they are an international organization and what's really cool about that is you have the insights of people from all over the world um, and how the workshop, uh, the curriculum worked for them or didn't work for them contributing to tutor the tutorial. Um, and if you go to their website, there's, the, um, at the top of the page, it tells you this is, this is what Django Girls is. They, they organize work workshops in Django, um, and that's pretty general, and because of that, every chapter does things a little bit differently. So what we do in Portland is not really like the Django Girls way, it's just how we have interpreted uh, the message. Um, but one thing in particular from the official documentation on running their workshops that has struck me is um, this line about how uh, the ultimate goal of the workshop is not to build a website, it is to show that code is fun. Um, and I think that that's really important just because programming and programmers are not generally depicted as fun-loving people. Um, they, they have their heads down and like they have their like metal or whatever like blasting and just shutting out the world. and that's not very welcoming to beginners and people who are not traditionally programmers. And I, I think that the fact that Django Girls is showing that you can be a person different from that and enjoy it is really important. Um, and as far as running these workshops, um, I really try to make sure that it is a place where anyone who has any genuine interest in learning will be accepted. I, I don't care what your reason is. Um, 
we have seen applications where someone is like, I am a bartender and I hate it and I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be a programmer. And that's, that's a wonderful reason. Um, it doesn't have to be like, I love the beauty of code and, and the internet age. Like that's another fine answer, but it's it, just as good. Um, we're here to help women decide if they want to be programmers at all or if they want to spend their free time programming um, or if they hate it and they don't want to do it ever again. That's also fine. And um, I think it's really important to have a, a venue for people who are just sort of curious about something that doesn't cost thousands of dollars like a college class um, because it's a lot, a lot of work and effort to spend on something that may or may not interest you in the long term. Um, at Jingle Girls, we do everything we can to make sure that they can come to our workshops without not just spending money on tuition, but um, it's a day-long workshop and we don't want people to be worrying about food, where it's going to come from, or if they can afford it. So we, we provide food for everyone, um, including dietary restrictions. Um, that also include, includes, um, at our past work, our most recent workshop, we have started to offer laptops for people who don't have them. Uh, to borrow for the duration of the workshop. And we were able to have three people at this past weekend who would not have been able to come otherwise. Um, and we want it to be a space that is encouraging, supportive, and non-judgmental for any reason. And that's, I think, should be true of any lear learning experience. One second. So this was the schedule at our most recent workshop, and it's pretty much the schedule for any of our workshops. Um, people come in on Friday evening, we feed them dinner, um, and then we begin with just some uh, brief talks from our volunteers talking about mostly um, their experiences learning a program and advice they have for new programmers. Um, and then we just spend that first evening um, going through the installation for what they'll need because we have so many different um, operating systems and hardware that you never know how long that just like installing Git in Python is going to take per person. Um, and then the next day we come in, um, there are groups of two or three women per coach and they work the whole day, we have lunch and, and that's it. And they come home and hopefully have um, an understanding of what programming feels like and if they want to keep doing it then there's people that they can talk to who are experienced that can help them keep learning. So you have your workshop or your um, whatever it is that you're doing to teach beginners. And the first thing that you should be thinking about is how are you making it inclusive? And I could not help but use this image from a Let Us Talk earlier today. Um, because when you're thinking about you know, words like diversity um, and making a space diverse, it's very easy to say, like, OK, well, I'm going to get like this person. She's like a woman, so that's, that's diverse. And like this person's black, so they're diverse and it's getting them together in this environment, and then you have created something that is inclusive. But that's not really true. Um, if you have an inclusive environment, you're setting up your classroom in such a way that different kinds of people feel welcome there and they want to be in that space. Um, and that also includes the way that people are finding out about your class. Um, something I think that Django Girls, uh, we can improve on is we generally advertise through Twitter and there's only certain people that have the, the energy and time to devote to like scrolling through Twitter and seeing things. Um, so um, we would really like to improve on the way that we're, we're hearing from people who want to come. This is a very long list that does not include everything of what you should be doing to make your class inclusive. Um, but it's also stuff that you are probably familiar with, um, like, um, you don't have alcohol in your space that you want to be comfortable for everyone. Um, the only one I think that is might be kind of controversial is the last one about um, financially compensating people who are coming to your class. And um, that's just something that I experienced when I was in high school. Um, I went to a class that was, um, it was called After School Matters and it was designed for kids in high school in Chicago who their, uh, their high schools might not offer classes in like art or web design or other cool things like that. Um, and it was free, but they noticed that lots of kids were not coming and they realized it was because um, lots of kids' families expected them to get jobs and contribute to the family income. 
And so they realized, okay, we'll just pay these kids to come to these workshops. And so kids started coming, and it was really cool. Um, and that would be really neat to see in the tech industry when there's so much money flying around. Like, why not to give it to people who don't have it who also want to be part of it? Um, so we have your, you have your classroom. It's super inclusive. That's great. Um, but you only have two days with these people, and they need to get very vulnerable, exposing like how much they don't know about something with each other. Um, how are you going to do that? Um, and the way that we address that at Django Girls is we ask our coaches to give lightning talks, like I mentioned. Um, and that's really great because it, it gives the attendees a chance to like see their teachers as, as humans and not just people that are there to, to tell them what they don't know. Um, and also that there are lots of different ways to get involved in the tech industry if that's what you're interested in. Uh, this is Haley, one of our co-organizers, talking about how her, her very traditional sounding path of becoming a software developer by going to college, um, being very interested in video games and, and computery things like that, but also having a lot of doubt about herself the whole time. Um, and we've also had, heard from people like, like Leta um, talking about her, her path to becoming a, a software developer. Um, and then I've also, I've talked about um, like this project about making a Twitter bot that makes butt jokes just to, to show people that it doesn't have to be like a serious life-changing thing to be a programmer. You can also make butt joke robots. Um, okay, so you have inclusive environment. People are more or less trusting of each other. Um, but still, not everyone who needs help in your class will ask for it. Um, and in a formal education setting, you might have you know, a whole semester or a year to, for people to, to feel more comfortable and start asking questions. But if you have a couple days like we do, um, one thing that we do in our environment is that we, we often provide rubber ducks, as I have pictured here, just as a, a cute thing and also a way to remind people that um, rubber duck debugging is a thing. And if you have a problem, you can, you can talk it out with your person next to you or just an inanimate object, and um, that also just makes them help, it helps make them feel safer asking questions because if you can ask a duck a question, surely you can ask one of the people who is there to help you. Um, and then as far as identifying people who might need help, um, this is a bit trickier, but as a teacher, if you just look around at your class and you see someone who is, looks very frustrated and has not asked questions in a while, it's probably worth just stepping in and saying, hey, is there, is there anything you need help with? How is it going? Um, and then it's really important, with, with beginners especially, to, to celebrate any, any victory whatsoever. And this might be hard for an experienced programmer because you probably do not remember how difficult and how time-consuming um, simple things were with you when you got started. Um, for example, like the, the picture here is of the, the Django It Worked page. Um, and that can take hours for someone just getting started to, to see. And it might not even look like an accomplishment to them because it just, it just tells you, like, you haven't done any work yet. Um, but it is a really big deal, and, and their teacher should let them know that that is a big deal. Um, another aspect of that is that your students probably have been trying to learn a lot on their own. Um, which is just a pretty isolating and frustrating place to be in, and no one there has been celebrating them and whatever accomplishments they've been making, so they, sh they should get the praise they can while, while you're there with them. Um, and then at Django Girls, we try to exploit the fact that excitement is infectious, and we often provide people with little maracas or shakers to like celebrate loudly with, and if you hear that from across the room, you might remember yourself like, oh yeah, we're, we're here together and we're working hard and we're going to support each other. Um, here's just a short list of some of the things that we, we know are celebration worthy at Django Girls. Um, getting your software installed, one thing means that you can go home on Friday, um, but it also means that you just accomplished a big thing and now you're ready to start software developing. Um, seeing errors might sound like a weird one, but to a beginner, on like a big scary segmentation fault might look like, oh god, I broke everything. Um, what did I do wrong? But as a more experienced programmer, you might know that errors are just the way that software happens and you move past them one by one and it's nothing to be afraid of. Um, similarly, 
fixing errors shows like, look, you saw the problem, you looked at the details around it, and then you figured out what to do to fix it. Um, pushing code to GitHub is a really big deal because now it means that your code is visible to the world around you, and that's, that's definitely worth celebration. And then the It Worked page that I mentioned. So jargon is evil, and it has taken over programming. Um, I have this, the screenshot here is of, I believe it's the official Python tutorial or the official Python documentation, and it shows why you should not tell a beginner to learn a programming language by looking at documentation, because none of those things are, are really English words that anyone would know. Um, so one thing that jargon does is that if you're trying to explain something to someone and they don't understand every other word they're saying, um, just to understand a basic concept you're telling them, they're gonna have to figure out what each of those individual words means and then put them together. Um, and if they have to do that long enough, they might just think, you know, I should know this already and this must mean that I'm not cut out for this. Um, as, as an example of trying to keep jargon out of your mouth as a programmer, um, one of your students might ask you, what is Git? And that's a perfectly reasonable question because Git is not really a word. Um, and for some reason, you might just go and Google that and tell them, oh, I got this off Wikipedia. Um, don't worry, Git is a version control system that is used for software development and other version control tasks. Um, and the person you're telling this to might be like, okay, um, and like pretend that they understood that and get more and more anxious. Um, so if you look at the statement and then highlight the things that most people do not know what they are, you end up with a lot of things that are confusing. Um, so what you might do to make this a little more sensible to a beginner is just define those words in plain English. And someone might be able to figure this out if you told them slowly enough and enough times. Um, but what I prefer is just trying to think of the simplest version of what you're actually telling them. And I really like this definition from try.github.io, which is just that Git allows groups of people to work on the same documents, often but not necessarily code, at the same time and without stepping on each other's toes. And this way the person you're telling actually knows what the thing is. Um, and they didn't need to Google any words that they're not gonna remember, and hopefully this will stick. Um, it's really important when you have a classroom full of people with varying skill levels that uh, you can define goals for everyone there that are sensitive to their experience and what they actually want to learn. Um, this picture is of all of the content in the Jingo Girls tutorial, and it's, it's a lot of stuff to learn in a day. Um, it's, it's so long just because you have people occasionally that do have a fair amount of programming background and you want them to have enough to do. <coughs> but you need to make sure that you have the expectation set that like no one is expecting you to finish this entire thing as a beginner. Um, and I had a, a student in one of the Django Girls workshops who was really, really frustrated, um, I think on the, the model section, and she was definitely not having fun and she was not going to have a positive outlook on programming after this. And so we just suggested to her like, why don't you move on to the front end? Like maybe that'll be more interesting to you. And she actually got really invested in um, making her Star Trek convention blog really beautiful and adding all kinds of uh, pretty front end and CSS elements to it. And that felt really great to me because it meant that she had something that she could take away from it that was practical to her and that showed her that she could program and that programming could be fun for her. Um, so kind of along those same lines, it's, it's important that as a teacher you're telling your students who you are and why they should trust you to tell them to do things, but also you should be finding out who your students are. Um, this is just a picture of a student who had a beautiful pug, um, and she made a beautiful pug shrine to them as her uh, Django app. Um, and it's really cool just to, to be there for someone as they're, they're learning how programming can be useful to them. Um, and also, um, you do not know what your students don't know, and that figures into jargon, but also assuming, um, Assuming things of people's backgrounds is a big part of why formal education breaks down for people. Um, it's assuming, okay, well, like they graduated from high school, so they've, they've probably started calculus, or I can give them this example of like, um, like Kojo in his last talk explained what arbitrage is to us because most people don't know what arbitrage is. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, you don't know what your students do know because just because they're a beginner at programming doesn't mean that they are not extremely skilled in any number of other disciplines. Um, and I, I remember there was a student who, um, her computer was kind of an older machine and was, was having trouble running like the server for her Django app and the browser and a couple other things. And so I came over and just told her like, oh, well, you should run the activity monitor and kill processes if there's a lot of memory in them. Like that, that usually works for me. And she was very patient with me and just turned over and said like, you know, I've actually been a sysadmin for 10 years. And I was like, oh, um, that's something I probably should have asked you about before assuming you didn't know this thing. Um, so it, it is a hard balance of like being careful not to assume your students know everything, but also that they know nothing. Um, but I just try to remember that and remember that like this person I'm talking to probably knows way more than me and a million other things, but if they need help with this, I will be polite and respectful to them. Um, and then the last thing that I have um, as a reflection from Django Girls is that uh, teaching is a collaborative effort. It's It's not as if you as a teacher are just like lifting knowledge into the bucket of their head that is empty. And they are not, um, they're not just working really hard and then bringing their project to you to say yes, that's good or no, that's terrible. You're, you're both coming together to help them reach a new concept or skill. Um, and in programming, there's a, there's a little bit of leeway because if someone asks you like, okay, what does this function do? You don't need to like know like right there, like okay, that's what this front function does and the parameters it takes and what it returns. You can say, okay, let's let's Google that because that's what I do at my job as a developer is I don't have a photographic memory of the documentation for Python, so that is you showing a skill to them. Um, I have had some trouble in knowing what the right amount of effort to exert is with students um, at a recent workshop. I would be explaining something to a woman there and she would just shake her head like, no, I don't like that answer. And she would call up her son who is a software developer um, and ask him the same question that she asked me. And that was really hard because one, like I really want to help everyone that comes to Django Girls and two, I did not want to be upstage by some dude I didn't know. Um, but I realized like, I had put in the effort, I had tried like a few ways to explain this to her and if she didn't want to try that and trust that I knew something, then that was the most I could do. So as a student, you should trust in your teacher to the extent that you are willing and um, assume that they know some things that they want, they really want to help you, that they have good motivations. And as a teacher, it's important to, to try as much as you feel that your student is also trying. Um, so if this stuff sounds like something you're interested in, um, I recommend that you just find little ways to, to bring teaching into your everyday life. You don't need to um, make it a huge burden on yourself if you don't have a lot of free time, but I recommend if you are a software developer and there are junior developers in your company and they don't really have a formal mentorship program, just talking to them if they, if they need help, if they, they have any questions that you could help them. Um, you could speak or lead tutorials at meetups or conferences like this one. It's really great. Um, I've done a few of those. Um, Workshops like Jungle Girls are really cool. They're they're pretty low. Uh, what do you call it? They're pretty low effort, I think, because you get to come in for a Saturday, which you probably have a free Saturday. Um, we've got our next one coming up for PyCon, so in May, um, and you make really great friends. I think um, people have come to HeidiX and seem to remember each other. Um, there's lots of really cool volunteer programs in Portland for uh, if, if you are okay with the energy levels of kids and keeping scissors away from them. Um, and really, if there are kids in your family who are at an age when they're statistically likely to stop caring about math or science, it's important to show them like, hey, I'm an adult and I love programming and here's why and I think you'll like it. Um, or if you want to help uh, be a teacher um, sitting on your couch without wearing pants, that's also great. Um, you could contribute to some open source tutorials like Django Girls. And um, I mentioned some of those places in Portland where there's uh, great opportunities for teaching and this is some of them. Um, and then I was really inspired by uh, the Django Girls workshop and the way that it presents material in like a fun accessible way and from there, I designed a few workshops, and I encourage you that if you want to teach something and you don't really see an opportunity or an organization for it, just go out and make it happen on your own. Um, 
there wasn't really a Python, uh, an introductory Python uh, tutorial on making a Twitter bot, so I made one. Um, I made this thing about programming vibrators um, with pretty illustrations like that. Um, and then I also have this thing about um, using surrealism to make websites. Um, so you could check those out on my website or you could make something even weirder. Um, I did not mention these talks, but they were very helpful to me. Uh, Nicole, I didn't realize that Nicole was here and giving this talk earlier today when I wrote this, but if you want to see a slightly different version from DengoCon, um, there's that. Um, I saw a really great talk at Code Her a couple of weeks ago from Mary Scotton, who was talking about her efforts to make Salesforce, where she works, more inclusive, and the, the problems that she's run into and the ways that she's tried to improve her perception of, of diversity. Um, and then Saran Yitvarek, possibly a different pronunciation. Um, sorry about that. She, she gave a great keynote at, um, at Django Khan about her privilege and how everyone has privilege and how important it is to acknowledge that. Um, and so I don't think I want to inflict this on people in real time, but um, something that I would like to challenge you to do today or in the near future is just to talk to someone and um, it doesn't matter who they are, if it's like the CEO of your company, there is something, I'm not saying you should talk to the CEO of your company about this, but like everyone knows something that someone else doesn't. And there is a way that you can ask them like, okay, well, how do you know about um, cheetah biology? I know a few weird facts about that. Could I teach you something about it? Um, and they might say, okay, like, tell me about that. And there is a way that you can be inclusive and supportive in your everyday life and teaching people. Um, and I just want to close with, uh, this is a portrait of our first Django Girls PDX class, which was now about a year and a half ago. Um, and something that I've seen in the applications for all four of our workshops is that people don't just one day decide, like, I'm going to want to program and I'm going to contact Django Girls and this is going to be my very first step into programming. They've usually been trying to learn on their own and it's, it's very daunting and isolating, and there hasn't been really anyone in their community that they could reach out to to help them. Um, but I think it would be really cool if there were just people who were there in their families or in their companies or wherever that could reach out and say, like, hey, are you interested in learning? I am here to teach you. Um, and that's it. Thank you.